from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm happy to welcome you here this afternoon for um, what I think is going to be very interesting, somewhat technical talk. Um, I'm the director of the Office of Scholarly Programs, uh, Carolyn Brown, and our speaker today is Dr. John Haynes, <clears throat> talking about the uh, digital con concordance to early Cold War Soviet espionage records. Um, let me just remind you before we start to please turn off um, any cell phones or other electronic equipment which one might go off and two might interfere with the recording. Uh, today's lecture is sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center, uh, the uh, result of a wonderful gift by uh, John W. Uh, Kluge to support um, advanced research in the collections of the library. Um, and provide a venue on Capitol Hill where members of Congress um, <clears throat> can have opportunities to talk informally with uh, some of the world's finest scholars. We're also a center for uh, research by the most promising of the uh, early career scholars. Um, for more information, you can go to the library's webpage, lower left-hand corner, www.loc.gov. Click on to Kluge and um, you'll find out about the programs and you can sign up also on the front page for uh, email notifications of programs. Just want to bring to your attention um, a new Kluge Center uh, chair, the Kemp Chair in Political Economy. And I've left some information on the back table about that. Uh, the library has this wonderful opportunity for a library staff. It's the staff fellowship, which enables uh, each year one member of the library staff uh, can leave his or her job, uh, whatever it happens to be in the library, and spend a year conducting uh, the fellow's own research in the Kluge Center. Um, and it's a great opportunity for staff, and it's been really interesting um, in my position to see how many library staff are actually serious researchers and somehow or other managed to uh, maintain an active research career even while they're doing their regular jobs at the library. Uh, John Haynes, uh, when he's not at the Kluge Center, um, and I hate to say this is his last day, although we have a new fellow about to join us, um, he's the specialist in modern political history in the manuscript division, um, which means he's the principal officer for acquiring primary documents, usually come in the form of collections, both for historical preservation and for research use. Um, and this is a specialist in his subject, modern political history. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, in the last, uh, well, I guess the last 10 years, um, he spearheaded the library's project to microfilm records of the, the Communist Party in the USA. Um, and was also active in another project um, to digitize common turn archives when some of this came available with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, these activities are particularly interesting because his work at the Kluge Center has been a logical extension, both of his work in the manuscript division, but also of what has been a very um, sort of interesting, I'll say a political career, or career in politics would be the better way to say it, um, and record of publication. Uh, Dr. Haynes has a PhD in history from the University of Minnesota. Um, and while he was working on that degree, he volunteered, always dangerous, uh, to work on the, uh, S uh, Senator Hubert Humphrey's campaign for president. Um, and next thing he knew, he was assistant state coordinator for Minnesota. Um, and the Minnesota government, having discovered his talents, uh, had him working in various capacities, for, first with the Minnesota Senate, the governor's office, as legislative aide to the Minnesota delegation here in Washington, um, with positions both in the House and Senate. 
um, before he joined the library in 1987. So he had that very pragmatic political background. Miraculously, those activities did not keep him from publishing. Um, he has 11 books to his credit. I did notice that his publishing career seems to have accelerated uh, when he got to the library. Um, but I wonder that he managed to do that as well. I'll just mention uh, some of his books uh, to, to give you a flavor of his background. The single authored book, Dubious Alliance, The Making of Minnesota's DFL Party, which is the Democratic Farm, Farmer Labor Party, um, name of it. That was in uh, 1984. Secret World of American Communism, 1995. The Soviet World of American uh, Communism, 1998. Uh, book of particular relevance today's talk, Vernona, Decoding Soviet, Ars Soviet Espionage in America. Um, and most recently, 2009, Spies, The Rise and Fall of the KGB. Um, so I'm sure you will find this uh, John's project uh, very interesting and Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, my year as, as the Kluge Staff Fellow has been a great pleasure uh, for me uh, to have the opportunity to focus on one thing rather than in my typical day at the Manuscript Division dealing with 12 or 13 things uh, at the same time. Um, it's been a great pleasure to focus on one particular subject. Carolyn mentioned two of the books uh, that I have dealt with, and what I have been working on uh, during my year as a Kluge Staff Fellow really is derivative uh, from two of those uh, books. The first one, Venona, Decoding Soviet Espionage in America. Uh, that book, which I wrote with Harvey Clare, a professor at Emory University, is based upon uh, 3,100 uh, deciphered international cables uh, sent between the KGB headquarters in Moscow and its offices uh, in the United States, uh, mostly during World War II. Uh, the messages themselves stretch from 1941 to 1950, but the bulk of them that were deciphered uh, were in 1943, 44, and 45. These were released by the National Security Agency, uh, America's Electronic and uh, Cryptologic uh, Intelligence uh, Agency, uh, in 1995. There are 3,100 of them, about 5,000 pages of material. Uh, and they were, uh, at the time they were released, the richest documentary source we had on uh, Soviet espionage operations. Uh, in the United States uh, in World War II. Uh, and that was the subject of this particular book. Now, some of those messages uh, here, for example, is one. Some of those messages uh, simply function to provide uh, documentary cooperation uh, for uh, espionage operations which we had been fairly confident of uh, from witnesses and other evidence uh, that had become available earlier. Here, for example, is one of the messages dealing uh, with the espionage activities of Julius Rosenberg, who at this particular time uh, had the cover name Liberal. Uh, and this discusses some of uh, a, a new recruit uh, that Julius Rosenberg has brought in. Further down in the message, uh, you will see uh, that it discusses uh, uh, Julius's work uh, to bring in his sister-in-law, Ruth Greenglass, and uh, brother-in-law, uh, David Greenglass, who at that time is working at Los Alamos, uh, into his espionage operations. Now, while I uh, frankly thought the evidence about the, the Rosenberg network was fairly uh, complete, uh, there were nonetheless uh, many Americans and a, uh, a group of uh, historians uh, who rejected the earlier evidence, uh, maintaining that the witnesses were unreliable, the FBI might have faked all of it, and uh, one thing or another. I think Venona put fairly well put an end uh, to those uh, doubts. But Venona did more than simply provide uh, further documentary 
support for espionage, which we had more or less known had already happened. It also had genuinely new material. For example, this particular message uh, deals with the initial approach of Theodore Hall, a young physicist uh, at Los Alamos uh, to the KGB where he offered his services. He was not in a sense recruited by the KGB. He was a volunteer. He sought them out and said, I'm working at Los Alamos and I will do whatever I can uh, to help the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Theodore Hall's um, uh, activities as a Soviet spy at Los Alamos were to the public completely unknown at the time these messages were released uh, in the middle 1990s. They were in fact known to the FBI because the FBI had, uh, had access to this information of course back when it was decoded uh, in the late 1940s. And it had in fact investigated uh, Hall and confronted him and tried to get him to confess. Uh, but uh, he was defiant uh, refused to confess. The FBI and the Justice Department judged that they did not have sufficient evidence that they could use in court because for a variety of reasons they, could, they would not and could not use the Venona messages in court. So essentially they said, well, too bad, he gets away. And indeed, uh, he got away with it. Um, but uh, his, but uh, historians, of course, were extremely interested to find out we had this uh, previously unknown a spy at, at Los Alamos. Well, the second book uh, which bears on the particular project I'm dealing with is my latest one, again with uh, Harvey Clare as uh, uh, my colleague, um, Spies, The Rise and Fall of the KGB in America. That too is based largely on a particular archival source. Uh, these are the notebooks of our third co-author, Alexander Vasiliev. Vasiliev was a young KGB officer in the late 1990s, uh, and in, I mean the early, uh, uh, late 1980s, and in the early 1990s he undertook a research project for the SVR, the uh, Russian successor to the KGB, uh, dealing with their operations in the United States in the 1930s and 40s. In the process of doing that research, uh, he um, uh, wrote his notes in notebooks, uh, the uh, seven notebooks, um, uh, all together around 1115 pages, all in quite neat uh, uh, Russian handwriting, uh, about the documents he was dealing with under the uh, terms of his research for the uh, SVR. Uh, Vasiliev uh, could not make photocopies of the material, but he could make whatever notes he pleased, and he pleased to make a great deal of the notes. Uh, in the 1996, Vasiliev left the Soviet, uh, left Russia, and moved to England. Uh, and then, uh, in uh, 2004, I was in contact with uh, him and discovered the existence of the notebooks. Uh, and we proceeded to prepare this book based on those 1,100 pages of material, uh, which we had first transcribed into word process Russian and then uh, translated uh, into English. The original notebooks themselves we also acquired for the Library of Congress. They're now a collection uh, in the manuscript division of the library. Again, uh, the material in Vasiliev's notebooks were a combination of things which uh, in a sense, elaborated upon and provided us a great deal more uh, detail uh, and uh, richness to what we had known about Soviet espionage. Uh, for example, this is one page of uh, page 119 of Vasiliev's black notebook. He didn't go in for elaborate names for his notebooks, he just named them after the colors. This is the black notebook and the white notebook one, two, and three, and uh, yellow notebooks one, two, three, and four, and so forth. Well, uh, this particular page, um, uh, he reproduced a schematic that was in a, a, uh, a 1945 uh, KGB document dealing with this technical intelligence networks in the United States uh, in February of 1945. Uh, these are all uh, cover names you see up here, but Anton at the top is the KGB officer who directed their scientific intelligence operations in the U.S. Um, Arsini, Aletsky, uh, and so forth, those guys at the top are the, are the field officers who are actually in touch with uh, sources. Then below them are the various uh, sources and networks uh, that uh, they are dealing 
uh, with. Now, because both the uh, uh, because Vasiliev's uh, work mostly dealt with the 30s and 40s, it overlaps a good deal of the Venona uh, information as well, uh, and. Uh, you put the two together and you really have a, a very uh, rich look at the, at the sort of the, the truly uh, heyday of uh, Soviet espionage, which really is from 1942 uh, to 1946. And uh, each actually fills in some gaps in the other, uh, one particular dramatic one. Uh, in 1944, uh, Colonel Duncan Lee, who was one of the uh, KGB spies within the American Office of Strategic Services. That was our intelligence agency in World War II, the predecessor to the CIA. Uh, in 1944, he gave the KGB a list of OSS personnel that OSS security suspected were secret communists and might be assisting Soviet espionage. Well, of course, the KGB was interested in that to see if, uh, if our security office uh, had actually identified some of their real spies. Uh, well, when the NSA released uh, the particular Venona message that dealt with this for reasons of its own, I don't think very good reasons, but for reasons of its own, it decided to black out almost all the names on the list except for Donald Wheeler. Uh, well, that, of course, this makes it not particularly helpful from a historian's point of view. We have a message here that sounds very interesting and a great many black uh, lines. Uh, so who are these people who OSS security suspected, uh, aside from Donald Wheeler? And Wheeler, in fact, was a, a Soviet spy. Well, if you uh, look through Vasiliev's notebooks and you come to white notebook number three, page 110, you will see there in the emphasized part, Vasiliev actually ran across this message when he was doing his work and wrote down the names. So there they are. Uh, so, in this particular case, Vasiliev's notebooks have filled in uh, what the NSA decided uh, to black out. Uh, and, frankly, I'm quite grateful uh, for that. Now, uh, another example of how these two sources work together. Uh, this is a transcription of a June 1944 decrypted Venona message uh, dealing with uh, several subjects, but I, let me call your attention particularly to the second paragraph. Uh, by the same post were dispatched two secret plans of the layout of the enormous plant received from Fogel. Enormous was the KGB's uh, uh, cover name for the American Atomic Bomb Project. And Fogel was one of their sources. So Fogel has provided plans for uh, uh, one of the uh, Manhattan Atomic Project's uh, facilities. Now, from other of the uh, Venona messages, uh, it narrows it down that Fogel was providing information about the atomic facilities at Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee, uh, though most of those facilities were uh, uh, dealt with uranium separation of separating U-235 from U-238, uh, U-235 being the isotope of uranium which was of most use uh, in building an atomic bomb. Uh, so uh, uh, there are four or five messages that uh, discuss the espionage uh, carried out by Fogel about Oak Ridge. Later his cover name was changed to Persian. Um, and it's clear that Fogel was uh, uh, at one time a very useful source for them. Uh, the particular plans uh, that he sent uh, turn out to be the plans for uh, a plant known to the Manhattan Project is uh, K-25, uh, which was the massive facility for the separation of U-235 and U-238 using uh, centrifuges. Uh, so the information that the Soviets received about how, as a matter of uh, practicality, we were able to separate uh, these two isotopes uh, would have been of great use to their, their own atomic program. But to the frustration of American security authorities, particularly the FBI, these messages, while indicating that Fogel was providing information about Oak Ridge, it provided almost no information about Fogel. Nothing about what agency he worked in, what his particular job was, 
uh, where he lived, uh, uh, whether, you know, just nothing personal about him. So they were never able to identify who Fogel was. They suspected he was a, a, uh, a scientist or engineer at Oak Ridge, uh, but there were thousands of engineers and scientists at Oak Ridge, uh, and they were never able to narrow it down even to a small number. Then co uh, comes along Vasiliev's notebooks. To the black notebook, page 112 and page 117. Up at the top, um, a good friend of Antenna. Now, Antenna is a, uh, another cover name uh, for Julius Rosenberg. He was uh, first Antenna, then Liberal. A good friend of Antenna, Russ McNutt Fogel, a civil engineer. It turns out uh, that Russell McNutt was a civil design engineer for Kellex. Kellex is a subsidiary of the massive construction firm Kellogg, uh, which had the major contracts for building Oak Ridge. And McNutt uh, was part of the design team for building the facilities at Oak Ridge. He was actually not at Oak Ridge. He was at the Kellex Corporation's design office in New York City, which is also perhaps one reason why the FBI never quite figured this, this out. But of course, as a member of the design team for building these buildings, uh, he was in a perfect position uh, to provide uh, the Soviets with information about how they were constructed and how they were built. Uh, and the KGB was uh, grateful for that. You'll see in the second uh, uh, item there uh, that Moscow, this is a message from Moscow to their office in the United States, uh, saying that they are allotting $100 as a bonus uh, to Julius Rosenberg because of his uh, great work in recruiting an agent on the American Atomic Project. All right. So you say, well, that's very well. Uh, you and uh, Claire got a hold of this information uh, and you wrote two books from it. What's the problem? Well, this is, I think, what the problem is uh, from a research historian's point of view. Uh, it took me uh, several years of intense reading of the Venona messages um, uh, to comprehend uh, what was going on. I wound up uh, uh, creating about 700 pages of elaborate notes so that I could find my way through them. Uh, with the Vasiliev uh, notebooks, uh, it was not quite as arduous uh, because I had been uh, actually directing the translators, and so I was helping to edit them even as they, uh, uh, the translators translated them. Uh, and so I was able uh, more easily to comprehend them and understand what was going on. But let me just give you some examples of why uh, if you don't have a couple of years to spend on this subject, why these sources, as rich as they are, and they are they, the two of them are the richest documentary sources we have on Soviet espionage in the 30s and 40s over here, why if you're not a specialist like, uh, like I am, in fact, I think there are only about six of us who I think actually uh, can make our way through this stuff, you're going to have problems. Here is uh, one page out of yellow notebook number one. That's one of Vasiliev's notebooks. Uh, look at what is on this page. Here's a, it's a letter from Maxime. Who's Maxime? You don't know. Well, he, say, he refers to Echo, another cover name. Who's Echo? All right, well, he's on the control commission of the fellow countrymen. Who are they? But he, uh, the, the fellow countryman of an organization in Tyre, is he referring to the ancient town in the, in the Middle East? Doesn't seem very likely, but that's what it says. Uh, he's getting information from Informer. Who's that? Uh, about the polecats. Who are they? Uh, he helps sound. Who's sound? Um, and he gives help to Antenna. Well, we heard about him before, Antenna's Julius Rosenberg, uh, to set up uh, groups on the XY line. What is the XY line? And then there are two more people, Marta and Hudson. Who are they? Then you go further down here, you see another cover name, Chap, further down, Ramsey and Huron. Who are they? And there's Rest uh, down at the bottom. Rest uh, seems important. He was recruited by the neighbors. Who are the neighbors? Well, I know the answer to all of that because I've read all this stuff many times and, uh, and have kept elaborate notes. But if you're not 
uh, in a position to spend a year or so reading all this stuff and making elaborate notes, we're going to look at this page and realize there's 17 cover names on there, and you really have no idea who these people are and what they're doing. Well, you can, of course, read my book and uh, understand some of them because some of these people are discussed in the book, uh, and so maybe you can uh, get to it that way. Now, the Venona messages actually present similar problems, though of a slightly different sort. Vasiliev's notebooks are at least available in electronic format. You can electronically search them. So if you ever do figure out who Echo is, you can, if you wish to, uh, go through the notebooks and find every reference to Echo. Uh, they're actually available on the web for downloading uh, at the Cold War International History Project website. Uh, they're there actually as uh, in the original Russian uh, in transcribed Russian and in the translated uh, English, all with the same pagination, so you could move from one version to another uh, without any difficulty. Venona message, messages, though, are, in a sense, easier and harder. The easier part is that when the National Security Agency's Venona project was deciphering these messages, when they actually deciphered one, they would put at the bottom of each message footnotes about who's who. Fine, you don't have to worry about who, who is who then. But there's something else that they, in a sense, didn't do. Here is an actual Venona message as it was released by the National Security Agency. It's a scan, an image. It's not in a searchable electronic format. And as I said, there are 3,100 of these messages, over 5,000 pages. There is no index. Uh, they're simply, they were simply released in five different uh, releases by NSA. They later put them all on the web, again as images, in a straight chronological order. So if you don't know where, you know, let's say you're interested in Julius Rosenberg, uh, uh, you know his cover names are liberal and antenna, fine. How are you going to know which of those 3,100 messages uh, talks about liberal or talks about antenna? You're not. Well, you can read the footnotes of, of uh, Claire in my book, but we didn't list every message that uh, he was mentioned in. We uh, simply footnoted the ones where it was relevant uh, to whatever it is we were talking about. So you have 5,000 pages of material which, as a practical matter, is virtually impenetrable uh, to a non-specialist. Well, One of the things which I uh, discovered after these books were out and uh, various other historians would talk to me about uh, subjects of particular interest to them, uh, whether it was Julius Rosenberg or, or um, uh, I.F. Stone or uh, Harry Dexter White or Alger Hiss or whoever it was, uh, they would call up and say, uh, in, in essence say, John, where do I look? Which messages talk about these guys? What pages of Basilius notebooks uh, discuss uh, Harry Dexter White? I can't find it. Well, I would uh, happily provide them with, uh, with references from my notes. Uh, the happiness declined over time as I got more and more phone calls uh, about uh, these subjects. I did have other work to do. Um, so one of the things which I thought would be very desirable from a historical research point of view would be the creation of an index to both Vasiliev's notebooks and the uh, Venona messages, because indeed they overlap and the same people are in both of them, uh, and a concordance so that um, uh, you don't, if you go back, let's say, Uh, to this particular page, you can look up Maxime and find out who he is. You can look up Echo. You can find out who the Polecats are. That, by the way, is the KGB's term for Trotskyists. They didn't like Trotskyists, though, so they gave them the cover name Polecats. Uh, and you can look up all of these uh, cover names and find out uh, who these people are. Now, another reason that you're going to want to have a concordance is this. Cover names get changed and, re and renewed and reused. 
For example, you may discover the person you're interested in has the cover name John. Well, there are seven different cover name Johns in all this material. If you happily go into the material thinking, I'm interested in what John does, uh, John is going to be doing some very strange things at different places because it's seven different people at different times in different places. So you're going to wind up making some really big mistakes. Uh, but that's only, of course, the Venona messages if you can get to them. Uh, and that, that's where you need the index or you need to have them in electronic format. There is where I, there was one uh, uh, bit of good luck, and let me mention that. Um, Mercyhurst College has an Institute of Intelligence Studies. It offers uh, a program for students, uh, undergraduates, and uh, uh, in, in essence, early graduate level, postgraduate, uh, for studies in, uh, in security and intelligence uh, tri uh, for, for students who are interested in careers uh, in, in Homeland Security or CIA or you name it, something like that. It's run by uh, mostly some retired intelligence officers and retired FBI agents. Well, one of, the, uh, one of their directors, a retired FBI agent, was quite intrigued by Venona, and uh, he realized that the lack of a electronic format version of the Venona messages was really holding up research. So over a period of 10 years, he had different sets of students transcribe the messages. Uh, and here, for example, is one of the messages, the one we've seen before, the, a transcription made by the students at Mercyhurst College. Uh, and early last year, he delivered to me a CDs uh, with every single Venona message transcribed, all 5,000 pages, all 3,100 messages, all in Word. But of course, there's still no index. It's just an electronic format. Again, you, you, you really need the index and you need the concordance in order to make proper use of these things. But the fact that it was an electronic format made it far more practical from my point of view to create an index and a concordance uh, with a lot less work. So my project, uh, which I've been working on, is to create an index, a page index, uh, and a concordance of cover names and real names for both of these sets uh, of material. And uh, as I said, you need the concordance not only so you can keep the separate different Johns straight. Uh, let's just say you're interested in one particular person. Let's say you're interested in Lawrence Duggan. Lawrence Duggan was a State Department official. Uh, he joined the State Department in 1930. He served as head of the Latin American Division uh, and then chief of the Division of the American Republics when the Latin American Division and the Mexican Division were merged. Uh, in 1940, uh, he became a senior advisor to the Secretary of State uh, on Latin American matters. He left the State Department in 1944. He was also a Soviet spy. So let's say you're interested in Lawrence Duggan and what he did. Well, one of the reasons why you need what I've been working on is that not only is Lawrence Duggan in this material under his real name, Duggan, he is also there under seven different cover names. At various times, he had the cover name 19 as, uh, as, you know, uh, as a number, but he's also in there spelled out as 19 and 19th. He had the cover name Official. He was also had the cover name Frank, uh, and he also had the cover name Prince and the cover name Sherwood. And just to make things uh, more complicated for you, uh, the Venona uh, project when it was decrypting messages uh, did not always translate the cover name. Sometimes they just put it in there in the transliterated Russian. So there might be a message uh, where instead of Prince you have Kamaz, uh, just the transliterated uh, Russian. So uh, getting all this straight uh, requires a lot of work or my concordance. Here is the entry for Lawrence Duggan. And with that, you can find every entry uh, to Duggan, uh, either in the notebooks or uh, in the um, uh, Venona messages. Now, one of the 
one of the problems that showed up when I was working on the Venona message part of the project is while the students at Mercyhurst, and I'm very grateful to them, uh, did a very good job of transcribing this uh, over 5,000 pages of material, uh, we are talking about undergraduates, uh, and they're not stenographers, they're not uh, highly skilled typists. They make occasional typos and typing errors. Uh, and occasionally, uh, when they're looking at a Venona message, uh, which was furnished by NSA on these very bad um, uh, PDF files or, or paper uh, copies, uh, they misinterpreted some of the words that were hard to read. So there are errors in the transcription. Well, fortunately, uh, in my indexing, uh, because of the indexing utility I used, a lot of these misspellings of, uh, of cover names or real names show up. Unfortunately for me, that means I had the opportunity and the necessity of going back to the transcriptions and correcting them. So I wound up proofreading involuntarily uh, 5,000 pages of transcriptions. So that slowed me down a bit. Uh, but that is what uh, the uh, project uh, was about. Uh, it is almost completely done. Uh, the notebooks have been completely indexed and, are, and all entries are in the concordance. In the case of the, of the um, Venona messages, um, I'm through the letter O and still have the rest of the alphabet to do. Probably another six weeks of work uh, if I had full time for it. When it is all done, uh, the, uh, both the transcribed Venona messages uh, will be put on the web. Uh, the concordance and index will be on the web, available for other researchers uh, to use. And I, 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 I certainly hope and I anticipate uh, that uh, it will make what uh, is a, two extremely rich resources readily available to researchers uh, who are interested in them but don't have a year to spend uh, 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 making themselves into a particular specialist on them. So that is what the project was. Uh, as I said, it's almost completely done. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure I can finish the rest of it uh, uh, in the next uh, few months, uh, even after I go back to my regular job. Um, and that is what I have done. Uh, are there any questions? either about the particular project or if you have questions about Vasilius notebooks or the Venona messages, we're happy to deal with those. Um, the and persona non grata. And do you think St. John Philby's father was as uh, ignorant of his son's activities as sometimes has been expressed? And what about Guy Burgess? Do you think he was a weak link in the Cambridge farm? Well, uh, that is, uh, uh, I don't wish to um, avoid the question. I'll, I'll deal with it as best I can. Um, most of my work dealing with them has only been with their activities in the United States. Uh, McLean, for example, shows up both in the notebooks and in Venona messages because uh, he served here in 1945 and 46 uh, at the uh, British Embassy in uh, Washington uh, and from that position was able to provide the Soviets with a great deal of information because, of course, our relationship with the British is extremely close. Uh, and, for instance, uh, uh, McLean was the British Embassy's representative on a joint Anglo-American committee dealing with the atomic bomb, uh, which made it, a, uh, uh, by the back door, a joint Anglo-American-Soviet committee, uh, which was not uh, what we had intended. Um, Philby actually shows up in the notebooks, uh, even though the notebooks don't uh, uh, deal directly with American operations, but because um, uh, in, 
in the fall of 1945, Elizabeth Bentley, uh, who was um, an American communist who had uh, participated with uh, Jacob Golos, her superior and lover in the, in the Communist Party, uh, in organizing and turning over to the uh, KGB uh, a number of rings of, uh, of covert communists who were then converted into espionage uh, networks uh, during World War II. Uh, after Golos' uh, death from uh, uh, a heart attack, uh, Bentley took over as the supervisor of these rings. Uh, but the KGB um, uh, had always intended to move them out of, of being the supervisors of these rings uh, because they regarded the American communists as, um, uh, as, and their, their habits as too loose, uh, not sufficiently professional. Uh, and after Golos uh, died, Golos was actually a Russian, uh, and so they did have some trust with him, but Bentley was entirely American, and actually they, uh, they didn't trust her particularly because you know, they just, she wasn't Russian. So anyways, they, uh, they uh, moved her out uh, of supervising these particular networks. Um, they were grateful to her for her work, and even after they moved her out, uh, they offered her financial uh, incentives and paid for a couple of vacations to spas to keep her in a good mood. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, she, in act, uh, she, in fact, was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, devastated by losing this particular work. Uh, because it, it had been an exciting work for her. It had been a work she had shared with her one great love, Jacob Golos, and he had died. He had taken over the, she had taken over the work, and now the KGB had taken it away from her. Uh, so she was very unhappy, very lonely. She had always been a heavy drinker, and she started drinking more. Um, uh, the, the KGB was, a, was aware of, of Bentley as a possible loose cannon, which is why they... Uh, uh, offered her money and they even uh, urged her to change her name and move to a, a, either out of the country or to a different part of the uh, country and they would finance it. One of their, one officer actually uh, sent a cable to Moscow saying that, listen, what we, uh, Bentley is extremely lonely. Uh, what we really need here is uh, for you to assign one, uh, one young officer uh, to become uh, uh, her boyfriend and that would take care of most of the problems. Well, Moscow didn't take up that offer. It might have worked, but they didn't try it. Uh, and Bentley's um, uh, morale got worse and worse and worse. She began to suspect that the FBI was closing in on her. They weren't. You know, this is a, a matter of, you know, the guilty flee when no man pursueth. Um, uh, so she went and decided she would um, uh, uh, act proactively went to the FBI and essentially said, here I am. Uh, and their reaction was, who are you? Uh, because they really had no idea that uh, she was a Soviet spy. Uh, and initially they thought when she started providing the story about uh, having presided over networks of several dozen Soviet spies in the government, they wondered if they were dealing with a nut. But uh, after a few weeks of, uh, of listening to her in interviews and doing checking, they decided, by God, she's a real Soviet spy, and this is the real stuff. Uh, and they got serious about it. Well, uh, in late uh, November, uh, after three or four weeks of almost daily interviews, uh, the FBI completed a, uh, a statement that summarized what Bentley had told them, um, and which Bentley signed as an accurate reflection of, of what she had said and what, what her understanding was. Uh, this is, was a hundred and about 111 pages uh, in this uh, uh, FBI document uh, that Bentley signed, Bentley's statement, in which she detailed uh, uh, her work and Golos's work and the agents they had recruited and who had done what and what uh, Soviet personnel they had worked with, uh, all kinds of rich details which would be used by the FBI, of course, uh, uh, to find these people and to uh, put them under surveillance and see if they could gather sufficient evidence uh, to uh, uh, bring uh, criminal charges. Well, what you find in Vasiliev's notebooks is that um, a copy of Bentley's statement winds up in Moscow less than a week after it was written. 
What happened was uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who of course got a copy of the statement, shared a copy uh, with the head of British Security Coordination, which is an office in New York, um, which was an, an arm of the British Secret Intelligence Service. Uh, and Hoover and the head of the uh, British uh, Security Coordination were good friends. They had the FBI and British Security Coordination had a very close relationship and worked well together. Hoover was very proud of uh, the work his agents had done in getting a statement from, from Bentley and uh, was eager to share it with his colleague. Well, his colleague uh, uh, sent a copy back to London to SIS headquarters where it was promptly read by Kim Philby who promptly handed it over to his KGB contact, who promptly cabled it to Moscow. Uh, and Moscow, of course, promptly sent a cable to New York and to Washington, to their stations here, emergency messages that, uh, as, as what it amounted to, uh, all is discovered, flee, uh, uh, with orders that all of these agents, and it listed everyone that Bentley had identified, notify these people they're going to be approached by the FBI give them these cover stories, give them recognition codes so that if we can ever contact them again, they'll know it's us who's contacting, uh, contacting them again. Uh, and, oh, oh, by the way, all of you guys who've dealt with Bentley, you're recalled to Moscow. Um, uh, which is why when the FBI actually put a number of these people under surveillance, it found they were doing nothing whatsoever uh, because they had been warned. Um, and Vasiliev's uh, notebooks, um, uh, you know, again, they, they don't deal with English matters, uh, British matters, but since uh, but uh, Philby's uh, source, uh, being the source of this information, is in the American files that he had access to. Uh, so he uh, he played a, uh, a major. You know, uh, Bentley's confession was a catastrophe for the KGB. Uh, it ruined uh, the the bulk of their networks in the United States. Uh, but it could have been even worse uh, if they had not had the opportunity to warn these sources uh, what was going to come down on them, uh, a lot of them would have uh, still been engaged in espionage. Uh, they would have been under FBI surveillance. They would have been in great legal trouble. Uh, and uh, if immediately confronted by the FBI, they might have broken. As it was, being forewarned, most of them um, uh, were able to stand up to FBI interrogation uh, and did not break. Now, of course, uh, which uh, helped to make sure they didn't actually get charged with the crime and go to jail, they all got bounced out of the government, though. Uh, that certainly uh, happened quick enough. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the only part of it uh, that shows up uh, in my particular research. Now, um, there are some Venona messages that are London, Moscow. I haven't gotten to them yet. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm sure some stuff will show up in there, but uh, there, there are only about, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 of them or something like that. I just haven't gotten to them yet. Yes, sir. Yes, it, it really. Is it just the case that the sources run out then. No, it re it really is Bentley, uh, because Bentley not only identified the sources she worked with, uh, and and she had actually worked with the majority of the uh, active agents the uh, the uh, KGB had at that time. What was just as damaging from the KGB KGB's point of view, is that she had worked with essentially every experienced senior. Uh, KGB field officer who was then in the United States uh, and identified them to the FBI. So essentially their careers as field officers was over. You know, they, you know, most of them had diplomatic status, they couldn't be arrested, but you know, they couldn't work anymore uh, because uh, the FBI knew who they were. So they were under surveillance, so they couldn't do anything. They couldn't dare approach any of their sources, they couldn't dare try to recruit anybody because uh, you know, their assumption was, and it was an accurate assumption, uh, that the FBI would be uh, owned to them immediately. So all of these experienced field officers were withdrawn. Uh, the, you know, the, head of the, uh, the head of the station and all the senior field officers in both New York 
uh, and Washington were withdrawn. Uh, and uh, that left only a few junior officers, most of whom had just arrived in the U.S., uh, and they were not in a position to do very much. Uh, they ha the, the KGB immediately sent over a new chief of station, but this tells you how bad things got. The new chief of station that they sent over in 1946 to, to replace uh, uh, Anatoly Gorsky, who was the uh, chief of station uh, that uh, had to be withdrawn, he had worked directly with Bentley, so you know his his days as a field officer were done. Um, the uh, the fellow they sent over had been in training to go to Tokyo. He was to uh, essentially establish the KGB's legal station operating out of what uh, the new uh, Soviet embassy in Tokyo after World War II. Uh, he spoke Japanese. He didn't speak English, but he was the only senior officer around who they had available, so off he went to Washington to become the senior KGB officer in the United States, and he couldn't speak English. Uh, there is, in Vasilios notebooks, a rather you know, a pathetic uh, cable that he sends back in mid-1947 uh, to Moscow, where he's essentially saying, I'm proud to report that I can now read an American newspaper with the help of a dictionary. You know, so here you have the senior uh, uh, intelligence officer uh, in the United States uh, who can't speak the language and can barely read a newspaper. Well, you, know, you really can't do very much. Uh, you know, things are in terrible shape. Um, so uh, 19, uh, because of Bentley, it really was a, a catastrophe. Now, in addition to that, uh, starting in 40, uh, late 46 and 47, um, that's when the first of the KGB cables of the Venona project were broken. Uh, and so the FBI now had both what Bentley said and uh, an increasing volume of, de of these deciphered messages uh, available to them so that essentially not all, but almost all of the agents and networks they had established in the early 1940s in, in World War II um, were, um, you know, were put out of operation. Now, for the most part, these people were not uh, prosecuted uh, because, uh, you know, for for intelligence reasons and for legal reasons, uh, there uh, the Justice Department decided uh, that they could not use the Venona messages in court. For one thing, the NSA wouldn't let them because that would reveal too much about our uh, deciphering uh, techniques. Um, but in any case, the, they also thought there'd be problems convincing a jury. Because, you know, they had, they had these uh, terrible visions of, of um, all right, you've got this message saying this and the defense uh, attorney uh, demanding that a NSA uh, cryptographer explain how they decoded the message. Well, NSA would go berserk at the very thought of that. Uh, and then the Justice Department thought, well, even if, even if NSA would let us do that, which they won't, uh, are we, is, is a, an American jury going to be willing to send someone to jail because some really nerdy uh, cryptographer explains how this page of random numbers actually produces this text? Are they just going to take it on faith? Well, they thought, well, maybe they would, but it didn't seem very likely. Uh, so, but in any case, uh, uh, by 1948, the uh, KGB only has two good sources left in the United States. One is Judith Coplin, uh, a Justice Department uh, analyst, uh, but, and she was, but she was in a very good position. Uh, she was a Russian analyst for in the Foreign Agents Registration section of the Justice Department. That is, the, uh, uh, the Foreign Agents Registration uh, Law is uh, one of the chief laws um, uh, the Justice Department uses for espionage because our actual espionage statute uh, requires that you, uh, they have to prove that you actually took a government secret and hand it over to a foreign power. So, uh, and sometimes that's pretty hard to prove. You have to, you know, actually, you know, trace the document in a sense all the way through. 
The foreign agent's registration uh, law is, is a lot easier because it's a law that says that if you're working for a foreign power, you must register with the Justice Department. And of course, there are plenty of people who work for foreign governments, uh, lobbyists and you know, all kinds of contractors and so forth. Well, they register, not a problem. It's a simple registration form. But spies don't register with the Justice Department. Uh, you just, you're not, you're not going to do that. So, uh, uh, so that means, though, that if they do catch someone who's cooperating with the KGB, even if they can't prove they stole a particular document, if they're working with the KGB, they have violated, uh, and since none of these people ever register with the Justice Department, they're in violation of that, uh, of that statute. Well, so she's a Russian analyst in that section, which means that whenever the FBI turns over to the Justice Department lawyers, we've got uh, this information on these people who we think might be working for the uh, Soviets. Uh, Judith Kaplan is reading the stuff and copying it and hanging it over to the KGB so that, again, they can warn the people that they're working with, you're under surveillance, cut everything out, uh, don't do anything, uh, and so forth. Uh, now, uh, she's a valuable source, in it, but in, that is defensive. Uh, she's, uh, what she's doing is helping them, uh, you know, uh, uh, in essence, protect some sources. But she's identified by the Bonona messages, and so she is actually arrested in 1949 uh, and tried. Uh, actually, she was tried twice, convicted twice. Uh, the convictions were overturned on technical grounds twice. Um, so she never actually went to jail. But in any case, she was out as a source. They had, uh, but after her arrest, they were left with only one source of, of any real value. But he was a good one. Uh, he was a Russian translator in the National Security Agency. In fact, he helped to translate some of these Venona messages. Um, but that is the major damage he did. Uh, the major damage he did, and this was, uh, in my opinion, enormous uh, damage. At the end of World War II, um, well, well, first, you know, uh, con uh, every country is good or bad at some kinds of things. In, in terms of intelligence, uh, the Soviets are very good at human intelligence, recruiting sources uh, and getting uh, recruiting spies. They're very good at that. We're not so good at that. Uh, what we are really, really good at and nobody's better uh, than the United States in this, is electronic intelligence. The interception of uh, radio messages and cables and all of that stuff, and breaking the codes. Uh, we're really good at that. And we're so good that at the end of World War II, uh, we had broken all five cipher systems used by the Soviet Army for its logistics operations. Uh, and we had broke them so thoroughly that uh, when uh, a Soviet logistics order went out by radio, you know, move to, you know, 200 tanks from point X to point Y, we knew about it within a day. Uh, when there's uh, all, of these, all of these traffic about moving ammunition and food and supplies and all of that stuff, we knew about it. Almost the same time the, uh, the, the Soviet commanders knew about it. And that's an enormous uh, uh, use to um, our policymakers and military commanders of being able to separate out what's serious and what's not serious. So if the Soviets are making uh, you know, belligerent noises on the Turkish border, well, if there is not a lot of logistics traffic showing that they're moving lots of stuff toward the Turkish border, it's just a bluff. Now, if they start moving stuff, it's not a bluff. Then you have to do, you know, really worry about it. So we were reading all of that uh, stuff, which gave our uh, military uh, uh, commanders a great deal of confidence that they knew what was going on and where it was going on. Well, in 1948, now this is known in NSA lore as Black Friday. Well, actually, it took about six weeks, but uh, you know, even cryptographers can get a little romantic, right? OK, uh, over a period of six weeks, Every single cipher system that we had broken went dark. The Soviets put in uh, new, higher, more sophisticated ciphers, and we went from reading everything of the logistics traffic to reading nothing whatsoever. Now, NSA suspected at the time that this could not just be the Soviets finally getting smart about uh, upgrading their cipher systems regularly. They thought there might be uh, a, a source in NSA. Um, 
and eventually uh, they thought they had identified the source, which was uh, William Weisspan, this translator, uh, because eventually the FBI identified Weisspan as a Soviet agent, so they thought he was probably the source uh, of that. He was, uh, he was confronted in 1950, he denied it, um, but then he made a mistake, uh, which was he was called to a grand jury. He could have gone to the grand jury and uh, denied it or even just uh, pleaded the Fifth Amendment. Instead, he refused actually to even go to the grand jury. Um, well, that's contempt of court. So uh, he, was, uh, he spent a year in prison uh, for contempt of court for refusing uh, the subpoena to go to the grand jury. Uh, but he never would have been tried if he had gone to the grand jury because uh, NSA would never allow him to be uh, uh, subjected to legal prosecution because they certainly didn't want him or his defense lawyers uh, you know, demanding uh, depositions and witnesses about his work inside the National Security Agency. Uh, so he was eliminated in 1950 and actually uh, with, with his elimination the Soviets lost uh, that source. But, the, but, but the, in terms of this enormous damage, in 1950, we still had not regained any breakthroughs uh, into Soviet logistics traffic. Well, beginning in 1950, uh, Stalin made a decision to okay the invasion of South Korea by North Korea, uh, and there was a massive Soviet logistics operation to supply the North Korean army with weaponry, uh, fuel, uh, uh, ammunition, and all the uh, all the material needed for a, an invasion. We didn't see any of it. If we had still been reading the, their logistics traffic, we would have seen it. And either the invasion could have been headed off by diplomacy, possibly, or at least it wouldn't have been the total surprise it was uh, when the North Koreans actually struck uh, in June of 1950. Uh, and of course, um, uh, you know, we lost 30 or 40,000 men in Korea, but uh, uh, the Korean War cost the lives of several million Koreans and several hundred thousand Chinese. Uh, so William Weisspan has a lot to answer for. General MacArthur had uh, alleged that the order of battle was betrayed. Do you, um, f by, uh, by the Soviet agents and, and the United States and others involved in their espionage network, do you, do you um, concur with that opinion or do you think it's a little too far out? Uh, it's an area which I haven't looked at, so all I can do is confess total ignorance. So I don't really have an opinion in that area. I, oh, poor Tom man over there. Uh, why don't you ask your question at the reception in the back? Because we are, um, even though we started late, we're still over time. Uh, but please thank uh, John for giving us a peek into the world of espionage. <laughs>